Well, thank you so much to all of you for being here. We really can't tell you how exciting it is to see a room full of people who are interested in smuggling. When Luigi, Achille, and, and I, well, Luigi was first of all, you know, the Italian mafioso reaching out a couple of years ago saying, we need to do something on smuggling. And of course, you're not going to say no to an Italian mafioso, right? <laughs> so I was like, sure, let's go ahead and get started. So we are very uh, excited and very grateful that all of you are here. And of course, once again, thank you to Chief Manjarres for giving us the opportunity to have this day, you know, just for, um, for us to discuss with you our research and to answer your questions. Um, one of the shortcomings that we have um, noticed over the years, the work that we do on, on smuggling, is precisely the fact that as scholars, we stay here on campus at the universities, and we don't reach out to you who are the experts, right? And the, so when we come together, I'm like, oh, guess what? I have figured out that this has been happening for 20 years, you know? And all of you as professionals go like, dude, I've been handling with this for 35, <laughs> you know? So um, this is, this conversations, you know, are really um, enriching to all of us. So thank you for, for being here. We'll be more than happy to talk with you. you know, we'll, we'll leave enough time after the, the presentation so that we can um, have a conversation and you can reach out to, um, to the people who are here today that are, all of us are so interested in learning from, from, from the work that you do. So thank you for being here. And what I'm going to share with you today is, oh, okay. It turned out a little romantic, obviously. Okay, so what I'm going to what I'm going to share with you today is very recent work that, along with my colleagues from the um, Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez, um, I have been carrying out in both Juárez, mm -hmm, Ciudad Juárez, and also through some interviews that we have been carrying out with circuit miners. Circuit miners are the kids who work. Uh, who, in the facilitation of border crossings, either involving either migrants or drugs. So, as you know, as new as this information is, um, I'm sure and certain that all of you, that several of you, have direct contact with this population, and we would love to hear your comments. So, um, again, I'll just try to to go through the presentation as fast as I can, so that we can answer questions and, and of course, feel free to make any comments that you um, see. Pertinent, that you think um, pertinent. So let's just go ahead and get started. This is too modern for me. There it is. So we cannot talk about on, um, circuit miners or the work that the kids do along the border without talking about unaccompanied miners on the border. The, those of you who have to handle with kids on a daily basis, and I see that with, with our students at the National Security Studies Institute, um, there's that, that concern over their, their very presence. Mm -hmm. We see kids from Honduras, Guatemala, um, and, and El Salvador, you know, and their presence is indeed significant. Mm -hmm. And not, not only here in the Paso um, sector, but also in South Texas, as you know, where most of the um, this population is arriving. Um, however, Mexican kids represent a significant number of unaccompanied minors, as you know, but uh, most of the attention has gone to those Central American kids. Um, there is a relatively recent um, project that was put together at the um, Pew Research Center in DC, and I want to share with you the numbers right here. So only in 2014, out of 11,000 apprehensions, only 24% of those kids had been arrested once. So that leaves about 76% of them, you know, having crossed the border, attempted to cross the border repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 76% indicated, indicated the multiple arrests. 15% of them had been apprehended at least six times. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an, an idea of this circular pattern mm -hmm. that is, again, very um, characteristic of, of circuit miners. Mm -hmm. So here we you know, start taking a closer look at unaccompanied miners from Mexico. Where are they from? Because, you know, again, they are not just coming from all of this, the states all over the country. So this is a map you know, from the, the country right here on the street. <laughs> 
And as you can see, the majority of the children who are uh, being apprehended at the border and who are of Mexican origin are from the state of Tamaulipas. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that you, you know, for most of, of the people in the, the room, um, that is the territory of a couple of very visible <laughs> transnational criminal organizations. <laughs> um, so that is where the majority of, of the kids are coming in. Another very important sector you know, of activity is the state of Sonora. Mm -hmm. Chihuahua, as you can see, which is our state, our neighbor state to the south, is not as represented. However, most of those who participate, or most of the children who are apprehended from the state of, of Chihuahua are kids who live in Juarez. Mm -hmm. As you can see from the, is that the one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The clustering right here, mm -hmm. the ports of entry, mm -hmm. and the location. There are other kids who are also fleeing from regions of the country, primarily in the states of Michoacán, Guerrero, and Oaxaca, which as you know, some of you uh, may know have also seen a significant um, level of drug trafficking activity and violence over the years. So um, about a third, once again, of all the unaccompanied children that are apprehended at the border you know, come from those two states, you know, Tamaulipas and Sonora. Mm -hmm. And Chihuahua's children are a, a matter of concern, primarily for those of you who work in this, in this sector, in part because they have not been that studied. Um, Chihuahua, you know, Ciudad Juarez, um, has, in a sense, um, despite the activity, despite the criminal activity that we get to see in this sector, we are not as visible when it comes to the, the characterization of border violence as Tamaulipas. Um, with the activities of the Los Etas and the Cartel del Golfo. Mm -hmm. But um, most of the, the children who are assisted in Ciudad Juarez, and we're just waiting now for um, the person who has actually been work, doing the work directly with the children, they come from neighborhoods on the periphery of the border fence. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna show you a map um, that indicates precisely what these neighborhoods are, you know, where the kids live. Mm -hmm. So you know, one of the, of course, as, as academics, we love to come up with fancy terms <laughs> and words for you know to, to name specific populations. Um, Mexican scholars have started to define this population as niños de circuito or menores de circuito. <laughs> this is primarily used for juveniles who are again involved in the smuggling of drugs and people. <laughs> um, they are primarily working as couriers or guides or lookouts. <laughs> And, and can I can I just get a general sense who has been who has been in contact or has had experience with any of these kids or population? Do you want to raise your hand? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the majority of these kids reside in the colonias mm -hmm, that are in the again in the very near proximity to the border fence, mm -hmm. and their ages range between six and seventeen years of age. Mm -hmm. Um, when I, I, my work um, has looked primarily at the social organization of the dynamics of coyotes, and I remember interviewing migrants primarily in Arizona who would tell me about these kids, but I had never had direct contact with them. Mm -hmm. It was only maybe about a couple of years ago when I started to receive calls um, in connection with a um, program that was put in place by CBP, which was the Juvenile Referral Program. Um, regarding these this kids who had anywhere between just a couple of, of contacts with, um, with CBP to up to 26. Mm -hmm. And again, most of them are, and I think this was one of the questions that kept popping up during the conversations during the day, the majority of them are boys. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, the work that, I've, that I have conducted on smugglers over the years indicates that there is indeed a very, um, important presence of women and females. However, their work is pretty invisible many times. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you ask the smugglers, they will tell you, ah, las viejas hacen todo. <laughs> the ladies are in charge of everything these days, right? Now they complain about the fact that, they, that it's the guys, the ones who get arrested. Um, but women in general in the, the market of smuggling on the U.S.-Mexico border, women perform activities that are seen as peripheral or non-important. But imagine, you know, hosting, or not hosting, but holding people at your, at your house, having to feed them. Um, they nurse um, 
They take care of migrants who have been injured along the way. Uh, they take care of kids. And I'm sure that you have seen that, some of those patterns on how um, the kids who are U.S. citizens are taken in by into the safe houses while the parents do the trek on foot. So, but the majority, again, of those who are involved in migrant smuggling um, are the most visible, let's put it that way, are males. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What makes these kids important for the organizations, right? Because that is what, those are some of the aspects that we thinking in terms of the, the groups and how they operate. That's what we really want to know. Um, first of all, you know, it's of course their age. Mm -hmm. The, it's uh, the kids report as well as organizations that, well, you know, since they are not going to face any charges, that is very easy to employ them or to use them to bring in to bring in the drugs or to bring in people. But most importantly, these are kids who have grown along the border. They know the ways. They play football. They hang out with their friends and family right next to the fence. Um, they go to the parks. They have friends and family who are also involved. So this is one of the main factors, rather than um, any others that may be more um, um, criminally oriented, and we'll take a closer look at those as well. Um, today we have um, all the presentations of factor that they have had in common is how um, most of the people who are involved in the facilitation, most of the people who are involved in smuggling, are defined as being poor people who, um, who are poor and that's why they, they become involved in smuggling. But I would rather say that people, it's, it's not because they are poor, they see smuggling as a way mm, to move away from that poverty. Mm -hmm. So they see this as a mechanism in a sense. And there are other reasons, because many times they just focus on the financial aspect. Mm -hmm. I will take a closer look at what the kids themselves report as the reasons that, um, that they have to enter the market or to stay, or to, in many cases, want to leave and exit the market. Um, but in terms of you know, some of the profiles, they are, you know, will be very common. They are members or the kids of single, single mothers mm -hmm. um, or mixed uh, families mm -hmm. that come together in Juarez, kids from, the, from, from mom, from different mom and dad. Mm -hmm. There's also very high levels of, um, they, they, they drop out of school simply they get tired, they, get, they say that it's boring going to school, that they don't see any challenge or they don't perceive school as being interesting enough. Um, some of them do show patterns of addiction. The work that I have done has also shown that addiction many times emerges during their participation in smuggling. It's not, it doesn't predate that participation, but it's actually a consequence once they start, once they um, have enter the market and work in it. So maybe you can, and you also have your slides. I don't know how clearly you can see the map on you know, the slides, but this is, oh, not that, not that one. So we are right here. This is UTIP. Mm -hmm. This is the border fence, you know. And these are the three colonias or neighborhoods where the majority of the kids come from. Felipe Angeles, as you can see, you know, it's in the periphery, really close by. Ampliación Felipe Angeles, which is this neighborhood to the park right here. And Puerto de Anapra, or Anapra as we call it here, you know, just more, more locally, <laughs> which is, as you can see, very close to Cristo Rey, where you know, several of us perhaps go, go hiking. This is the sector of the the fence that is just being um, rebuilt. Mm -hmm. So many of these children really just have to, to walk to, as you can see, throughout, in, very close to their neighborhoods. They don't really need to go that far. So what are the reasons that would lead you know, to, a, in, to a seven, eight, nine-year-old you know, into participating in the smuggling of of migrants, you know, primarily of migrants. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to situate them, first of all, as another you know, fancy term, structural vulnerability. Mm -hmm. We are talking about communities along the border in neighborhoods that lack um, basic services where education is not a priority, not only for, for the kid, but also for the city, right? Ciudad Juarez wants workers. They don't want an educated population. Mm -hmm. 
So there is a lack of opportunity of educational, recreational opportunities. There's also, of course, the very, you know, the immediate proximity of Juarez you know, to the city of, of El Paso. Mm -hmm. Also the perception among older smugglers mm -hmm, that children from Mexico can be returned within hours. Mm -hmm. So as soon as they are arrested, they can just be sent back. Um, and they, you know, without facing any consequences, which, you know, when I've interviewed several of, 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 uh, of you, you have expressed this frustration, you know, when this kid's being arrested continuously, you know, finding them, you know, over and over. Mm -hmm. There is also a very much um, culturally based perception for those of us who are of Mexican American or Mexican origin in the sense of what makes you a man. Mm -hmm. Uh, for those of us who were raised in low-income, working-class families, you know, without <coughs> a house, without a dad, um, going, growing up was about getting your, you know, finding a job as early as you can, as soon as you could, mm -hmm. especially if you had younger siblings. So it was about going out there to support your family, to provide for your family as the oldest man, you know, as the man of the house. So in these cases, many of the families are, um, the, the head of the family is a single mom. So the oldest son is perceived as the one who has to go out and take care of the family, take care of the younger siblings. So I'm giving, don't tell the chief that I'm giving you the answer to the question of the post-test. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How are the children recruited? Mm -hmm. Because, and this is, this is a question that often you know, comes up when, um, when we think about um, crime and, and criminology and criminality, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But um, the kids, the, the way they are recruited to participate is actually very similar to that of adults. Mm -hmm. They grow up, you know, they, are, they have friends, they have family members who are already involved in smuggling. So most of the, hardly, um, even though many of them are um, forced in the sense that they may be walking down the street from, from work or from school and they get, um, um, and some of these adults or some of these organizations may come and force them to, to work. Most of them do it, and you hear it, you know, in, quote, in quotes, <laughs> um, voluntarily. Mm -hmm. As a result of an invitation from friends, neighbors, um, older siblings mm -hmm. that tell them, hey, you know, you're not going to school, you're not doing anything, just come and, come and hang out with us. Initially, this is, again, a very friendly invitation for them to join the market, and one that the kids find very exciting. Imagine being 11, 12, and being invited to hang out with older guys who are doing you know, this kind of work. So there's uh, an excitement factor initially for, for these kids. There's also, of course, as I mentioned, the intimidation that takes place in these communities that is very real. Mm -hmm. And that involves older, mm -hmm. not, a, not necessarily adults, sometimes just older kids, 14, 15, mm -hmm. uh, 15 year olds that are a little bit more experienced. Something that is also very common among facilitators of all ages is an entrepreneurial sense. Mm -hmm. Sense that, hey, you know what, this looks, this doesn't look that bad. I can make anywhere between, you know, $400, $700 a week. I'm 11, hey, you know, I'll do it. I'll, I'll look for these opportunities. Um, a few days ago, I was interviewing one kid uh, who was telling me like, well, you know, I just look for them. I look for these opportunities. Like I just went through, I, I spoke to different people and I found the one that better you know, suited my, my, my wishes, what, what I really wanted to do. So many of them, they once also want to be independent in line with what they see or they perceive as independence. Um, living in these communities, having a car, being able to buy um, clothes that they like, being able to uh, protect or give their, or, or share, rather, their earnings with friends and family members. Um, however, you know, let's, uh, we also have to, we must talk about the vulnerabilities that they change, that, they, that the kids face. And of course, you know, again, initially, this may be very exciting to them hey, you know, I get to bring groups of people to the border, I get them across, it's cool, right? <laughs> and perhaps, and, you know, looking into our own experiences, um, perhaps at some of, you know, when we were teenagers, we found something that we really liked, that we really enjoyed, and that very soon got boring. Mm -hmm. 
And that is in many instances the case of these kids. They, are, you know, they work for a couple of months, they get very excited, they find it intriguing, they get to hang out with older guys, they get to see um, things that they were probably not seeing at home, but after that, they get tired <laughs> because they are asked to be at work at a specific time. They are, um, there is this um, growing sense of obligation that is imposed onto them. And they are gradually, they are not as excited mm -hmm. as they initially were. There's also, of course, power differentials, right? You're working with people who are older, mm -hmm. who already have a reputation in your community as being dangerous. Mm -hmm or as being very much involved in a specific activity, and that you cannot really say no to. Imagine as a 12, 13 year old, having to articulate a, you know what, I don't really want to work with you anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the factors that also take place. Um, this doesn't mean that their parent, participating in smuggling doesn't mean that your parents as a, as a kid don't love you. Many parents are actually, they, they do constantly express you know, extreme concern over the safety of their kids. However, they, are, they do not have the necessary tools to allow for the kids to exit the market. <laughs> many, of, uh, many families actually become to depend on the, the income that these kids generate. <laughs> so the thought of them stopping working you know, actually is, is actually scary in some instances. <laughs> Um, of course, another factor is you know, the, the very fact that these kids are, even if they decide to stop, they are not moving away from these communities. Mm -hmm. They are still going to stay in Anapra, mm -hmm. they are still going to stay in Juarez, mm -hmm. so they are not moving away. Mm -hmm. Their families are still there, and the, um, the conditions or the circumstances that put them in that, in, in, that led them to enter the market are still there. Mm -hmm. and in the case of law enforcement, there's of course a sense of mistrust. When you ask them, like, why didn't you go and ask for help? Like, hey, I can't trust anybody. I can't go, I can't trust the police in, in, um, in Juarez. Like, well, you know, can you trust CBP? Can you trust immigration? And they would say, no, we can't trust them either. And there's that, that sense of, of that everybody's watching them, that somebody's going to go back and report them. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, there's all of that acting out that you have probably seen in some of your encounters with them. Mm -hmm. When many times they also make self-incriminatory statements about what they are, what what they do, or how they, um, or the roles that they perform within an organization. Mm -hmm. And the work that again that I have been um, lucky to to perform along with my colleagues from the OASJ. Mm -hmm. Um, try to, rather than you know, just looking at the criminal aspects of it, we're trying to figure out to sort out how do we help them? How can we, how can together, you know, all of us you know, combined, come up with an alternative that would tackle some of these conditions, some of the challenges that the kids face? <laughs> well, first of all, when uh, it is important to notice or to, hi you know, to highlight the fact that the conditions that many of these kids face are defined you know, by international protocols as forms of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. They are performing forced labor. Mm -hmm. um, another aspect that we need to keep in mind is you know, we have the, this perception of the smugglers, of how they are, how they operate. And the work that we have been lucky to, to carry out over the last few years, um, several of us, has, been, has involved reaching out to these communities, to the smugglers themselves. Mm -hmm. And to, so that we can better understand how they operate, because most of our our information, most of the intelligence is that um, not necessarily the intelligence on the side, but most most of the data that migration scholars have collected over the years come from victims, not from smugglers themselves. Mm -hmm. So the work that we have trying to do, and that as a collective of researchers, you know, and that's what we are uh, we were lucky to have. Uh, such a, a great international crowd today is because we want to understand, we have to, we want to, we need to have a better understanding of how smugglers themselves work. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have to understand, once again, that this is that while poverty is a factor, mm -hmm. that poverty and equality don't just show up or just happen. There are other causes that are motivating this participation on the side of the kids. 
Um, my friend and colleague, Fernando Loed, I was, you know, just keep looking to the back of the room, hoping that he will walk into the room. He was the director of El Leaf. Mm -hmm. So El Leaf was the uh, Mexico Mi Hogar. That was the shelter that was receiving the children who were being sent um, to Mexico following their, um, their processing and identification as menores de circuito, as circuit children. And he was the one who collected during the, has been collecting the data on the children and the numbers you know, over the last few years. So the, number, the, uh, the numbers for 2016 actually cover all the way from January through October. Um, by the end of the year, um, the number um, um, surpassed those. So the number of children you know, in follow-up programs being served by the shelter had actually um, surpassed that of 2015. So we see a clear increase over the last three years of the children who are entering the, the, the market and receiving services or being actually referred for services to the shelter in, in Juarez. The shelter is trying to tackle some of the challenges that the kids face. And for that matter, they have developed this you know, multidisciplinary and systematic approach mm -hmm. that involves um, individual or individualized attention with the kids. You know, as soon as they get to the shelter, they are screened, they are interviewed, they are assigned a psychologist, and they, all, they are also assigned a social worker who can work with them through the process mm -hmm. to see if there's, um, there are any, um, any resources or any opportunities that they can be canalized into so that they can improve their um, chances at leaving the market. So, you know, just look at the, some of the numbers right here in terms of the, the kinds of service that they receive. So they are assigned you know, to one social worker, one psychologist who works with them and with the family. The kids are also provided with education. As of last year, you know, there was one social worker for 150 cases. Mm -hmm. The same apply for the psychologist. Mm -hmm. In terms of education, the kids had, um, you know, they, they, there was a smaller group of students and they had, uh, um, mm, they, they were receiving regular subjects, you know, for, for elementary and middle school. Almost done here. I just want to also, um, bring up one case that perhaps some of you are familiar with. Um, in, in response, in a sense, to the, the challenges that CDP was facing, you know, with these children being, you know, coming in constantly, you know, and circulating through, through the system, um, the juvenile referral program was uh, put into place. This was in 2014. Mm -hmm. And the goal was to detect and retain mm -hmm, children who were eligible for criminal prosecution given their involvement in smuggling. Mm -hmm. And the program started in South Texas, mm -hmm. <coughs> and from there it extended to other um, border sectors. Mm -hmm. And this, um, the children would be you know, uh, perhaps detained uh, along the, um, the border, and then from here they were placed in other detention facilities throughout the country. Mm -hmm. um, one of the there's estimated about 500 children went through the program, which lasted about a year and a half. And it, has, you know, it, it, it was discontinued in, in 2015. Uh, and this was primarily in response to civil rights organizations that expressed concerns over the fact that the children were being held by, um, for in, indefinite periods of time. Mm -hmm. And often in high, you know, high security uh, facilities for a population that was considered high risk. Um, many of these children had being um, witness of cases that were connected to human smuggling or drug trafficking. They themselves have been participating in some of these offenses. So there were, of course, concerns from the, um, from the side of law enforcement. Um, the ACLU also filed a, a case um, to get access to, to some of this information in terms of, of uh, what, what was happening to the children and for how long they were um, held in custody. One of the it's one of the recommendations that emerged from the juvenile referral program experience 
and that multiple organizations that work with children, with, work with minors along the U.S.-Mexico border have expressed is the need for better screening tools when it comes to human trafficking offenses. Mm -hmm. um, and this better, um, this improvement when it comes to screening tools, again, has to come not only from the American side, because we do recognize that most of the, the demands have been placed on U.S. authorities. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're not screening, the, you're, you're not providing, the, some other organizations are, are making statements about U.S. agencies not screening properly for trafficking or for fear of, um, for um, the, the claiming that many of the children would actually qualify for relief mm -hmm, under international conventions. At the same time, mm -hmm, we are very much aware that the Mexican government is not doing you know, their share when it comes to also screening them or identifying them. Most of the children who go back to the shelter, who are, who are sent <laughs> back to Mexico rather, go back to the, um, to the module, al modulo, mm -hmm. on the border. And then from there, they are immediate, most of, the, most of them are immediately picked up by smuggling facilitators so that they can go back into the business. Mm -hmm. So the Mexican government doesn't really have any measures in place that would ensure the protection of the children once they, are, they go back to, to Mexico. In the case of the shelter, um, the shelter was only um, attending about 25% of the children who were being returned. Mm -hmm. So the numbers that I showed you, the 150 families that they were working with, mm -hmm were only representative of about 25% you know, of the, fam the children who were being sent back. Mm -hmm. This is you know, just a quick collage that they put together on the activities that the kids would perform at the, at the shelter. And again, you know, we'll be you know, very happy to, to open the, um, that's what we, in fact, what we're doing next just opening the conversation for, for any questions that you may have. Um, the slides include the contact information for all four of us who are working on this project. And so if we don't get to talk with you today, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to, to share our information with you. Thank you so much, and I'll be happy to take questions. <laughs>